Uh, but it, it is what it is. Um, so, uh, yeah. I am very sorry that the slides are not working. They've never not worked before, so guess what I'm gonna get to spend time doing this week? Figuring out why the slides aren't working. So now that I have lost nearly 10 minutes of class time, uh, it is time to rock and roll. Carl, you are ready, right, by the way? Because you are gonna be up today. The, uh, this is not it right now, but we're going to get to you fairly quickly. Um, so, I'm going to start by opening us with prayer. And just a reminder, I'm going to cue you in. I want you to pray with me. Join me in ending the prayer with, I believe, help my unbelief, which is a biblical prayer. So, uh, Father, uh, we ask you to heal our technology. <laughs> um, but uh, in the meantime, still uh, pour out your spirit. Uh, for Holy Spirit, if you don't teach us, we won't learn anything. Uh, give uh, each and every person here uh, wisdom and insight. Uh, lead us in interactions that really help address things that make us, well, doubt that there's anyone even listening to this prayer. Uh, strengthen our faith. Uh, we ask in Jesus' name and we pray together. I believe, help my unbelief. So hopefully you guys have really memorized the memory prayer because it's not up on the slide this time. But I'll give you a reminder of what it is and then just try your best to say it with me, okay? So the, the verse that uh, is sort of setting the groundwork for this module is 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. I love it. Oh, I heard people doing it with me. Let's do it one more time just for good measure. 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Be watchful, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Let all that you do be done in love. Uh, and the reason I couldn't just have you pull up the Pew Bibles uh, is because in the ESV... Uh, the phrase, be courageous, uh, is actually a, my own translation of the word andridzeste, uh, which basically translates more literalistically as act like a man. Uh, but because of some context things and from other uh, literature, uh, I sort of know that that is a colloquialism that's trying to communicate our idea of be courageous. So I, I did do some interpretation in translation, but I still think it's um, accurate. Uh, but fun things to know. So, just a reminder, this class each and every week uh, is to strengthen our conviction that the gospel is true. Uh, I know it's apologetics, but it's firm in the faith, apologetics to strengthen our faith. Um, we will talk about evangelism from time to time, especially if you guys ask evangelism questions, but that is not my big goal. My big goal is to address issues that people in the congregation have communicated to me uh, uh, to address issues that make people doubt. Right? I, I asked, hey, send me defeater beliefs, uh, send me ideas that make you doubt. And uh, so basically everything I'm addressing is something that someone sent me. So even if you find a particular topic doesn't make you doubt Christianity, someone in the room does. Uh, so uh, let's uh, always approach things with some compassion. Uh, now this does lay a firm foundation for stepping out in faith to love one another and love Raleigh. Uh, the idea is that we have a progression of four modules that's going to take us somewhere between one and two years to get through. Uh, but we want to start with uh, laying a foundation of our faith because when we get to things like serving the neighborhoods around us and doing evangelism, that, if we do, are not firmly, uh, as Colossians uh, 2 puts it, if we are not rooted in the faith, built up and established in him, abounding with thanksgiving, we're not going to have a good foundation to step out in service and to do evangelism. So while there is, that, that is a, a thing that we're going to talk about and get to much, much later, today is about helping make sure uh, that we are convinced of the gospel. 
Uh, and then, of course, that is uh, sort of a necessary uh, tangent of that, is that it helps us believe we have good news that is important enough and necessary enough to tell people about. Um, now, I'm going to remind you of last week, which, by the way, um, technology is betraying us everywhere. Uh, the recording uh, exploded. Uh, and so there's a different recording. So if you go on to review things I said last week on YouTube, and you're like, that's funny, he's wearing a different shirt, and I don't remember him saying that. You're right. I actually re-recorded it uh, during the week. And so there is a different version of the class, but I think I said mostly the same. Jim, did I say mostly the same things? Yes, you did. All right, so yes. So I, I mostly said the same things, although I did find out that Having people in the room is good for me and my soul. Because uh, when I'm just talking to an empty room, I sometimes just say what I think, and that's not healthy. <laughs> um, but I do want to remind you of some things we went over last week. Uh, because right now we're dealing with a fairly sensitive topic, uh, which is that the Bible has been misused. And I do want to clear it, be clear it is misused uh, to justify oppressing people. In particular, uh, Christians have historically, particularly in the last 500 years, that a lot of people think that this is a throughout time thing, but actually it's in the last 500 years that the church has been particularly guilty of using, misusing the Bible to condone oppression of women and slavery. Uh, and so uh, in particular, we were talking about the Bible being misused to mistreat women. Uh, and uh, that, that is a thing that we said has happened. That is true. Christians have done that. Now, that is not the historical pattern of Christianity, uh, but particularly in the last 500 years, uh, as we've become unmoored from Christianity but still keep naming the name of Jesus, uh, Christians have uh, misused the Bible to mistreat women. Uh, but if you actually read the Bible and you understand it correctly, I demonstrated the Bible is full of commands about protecting the vulnerable, in particular protecting women and girls and empowering them. And so while there have been exceptions, uh, again, notably in the last 500 years, uh, in gen while there have been exceptions, in general, it is far more accurate to say that women have been lifted up, empowered, and protected where Christianity has taken hold. Uh, and the very real cases where that is not true are the exceptions, not the rule. Uh, and we, again, we looked at some of those. Um, we looked at that just very briefly last week. Uh, but that has been so because the Bible... Jesus himself teaches that men and women are equal. Equally made in the image of God, equal in worth, dignity, and value. Uh, and now, they're not exactly the same, right? And so that leads us to the where we left off, which is, is going to get us into a thing that brings up a lot of questions. The Bible does teach that we are ontologically equal, economically complementarian. Uh, and uh, again, most of the, you, this means nothing, but because of some things in the winds and this being recorded, uh, I, I just want to say that I, while I am carefully borrowing some language from the Trinity, I am in no way walking the line of the eternal subordination of the Son. If you're like, I have no idea what that means, go look it up or don't. It doesn't matter. This is a CYOA thing. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yes, the, the Bible says that we are, at the core of our being, men and women are equal. We are both equally made in the image of God. But we're like admirals and generals. Uh, we have the same rank, but we have different, uh, uh, different fields of battle at times in certain limited areas. Uh, and I also just said that if you have been, ladies, if you have been hurt by men in the church, if you have been hurt by men in the name of Jesus, that was wrong. And those men were not 
acting for Jesus. Uh, I just, I, I don't, I'm so sorry that those things have happened. I'm, and, and I don't know if they're Christians or not. I'm not going to say those men weren't Christians, but maybe they weren't. And if they were, um, they were Christians behaving badly, which, again, never surprises me because the church is a hospital for sinners, um, but it's still not, that doesn't make it okay. That doesn't make it appropriate. Uh, and so I just, yeah. All right, so before I get into uh, this next issue about the whole what's up with uh, you saying that men and women might have different roles business uh, if they're equal, um, any questions about any topic other than that uh, based on that review? Uh, I'll also accept... uh, uh, comments and smart aleck com- and smart aleck remarks. <laughs> All right. So, I keep looking up like you guys can see these slides, but you can't. However, they're my notes that keep me going, so I'm still looking at them. <laughs> oh, perfect. Mark can see my slides. Um, so there is an issue. This is not so much a difference of Christianity. Uh, as there are, I believe, legitimate churches that love Jesus and are trying to follow him who disagree with us about the issue of women as pastors. Uh, so, so I'm not defending Christianity per se, although I, it is the historical position, and I do believe the Bible teaches it, that actually women are not allowed to be pastors. And that is going to be a sticking point for some of you. It's going to bother some of you, and I understand why. Now, dealing with the Old Testament, it's actually far easier to deal with. Uh, I can quite easily just say, well, most priestesses were being used as cultic prostitutes in pagan religions. Uh, But on this side of the cross, and in the last you know, thousand years worth of history, at least in the West, uh, uh, women are still used as cultic prostitutes in many religions uh, on the other side of the world today. Um, but uh, in general, in the West, this has not been the case. So why still can't women be pastors? And um, I, I do not have a completely satisfying explanation because I definitely have that question for God, too, at some level. However, I am convinced this is what the Bible teaches, and so I'm going to show what the Bible teaches, and I'm going to make the best defense I can, and then we're all going to walk away a little bit unsatisfied. So first, uh, I want to point out that uh, we believe that women cannot be pastors in the same way that we believe that most males cannot be pastors. Only the called are ordained. So exclusion applies to men as much as to women in that sense. Uh, I also want to point out that women still completely and utterly participate in the priesthood of believers. Uh, The Bible tells us that after the destruction of the temple, Uh, And with the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, all are now, uh, you know, all are the same. There's no Jew nor Greek, no male nor female, no slave nor free. Uh, And so that all Christians participate in the priesthood of all believers. So the the priesthood has been released from the clergy in some sense. I I don't want to get into a huge theology of clergy because that's its own separate lecture, uh, I, I would argue there's still certain priestly functions that's appropriate for a pastor to function like a priest, but the priesthood as it was, was in the Old Testament has actually been released to all believers. And so women, as much as men, still participate in the priesthood of all believers. Uh, and I do want to point out again, Plenty of women, both in the Old and New Testaments, received exalted roles as teachers, judges, and prophetesses. Whether it's Miriam in Exodus 15, Deborah in Judges 4 and 5, or Huldah in 2 Kings 22. 
Um, and uh, in the New Testament, you see uh, Lydia being an early leader of the church. You see Aquila and Priscilla, a man and woman team, teaching the one who became an apostle. Right? So obviously there is... It, when, uh, there, there is a particular verse that talks about women not uh, exercising oversight. And some will say, so, see, a um, woman can't teach a man, but that is easily demonstrated as an absurdity by reading the Bible. Uh, because women do teach men on several occasions, and they are called blessed for doing so. Uh, so, it cannot be a sheer and strict uh, keeping women from all teaching roles. It is very specifically uh, the ordained offices that women are clearly from the Bible excluded from. And uh, this, I will tell you, I don't fully understand. Like I said, I don't, I can't give the full reason but the reason I do, am fully convinced that the Bible teaches it and that it still applies today is because the Bible roots it in creation in the New Testament. 1 Timothy 2, verses 11 through 15 say this. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. So again, people will read this verse, uh, this phrase, Without any other context of the Bible, it's as though they forget the rest of the Bible, the rest of the New Testament exists, and, see, and say, see here, it's clear in the Bible. Uh, Paul says it, except they forget that the Bible actually comes to us out of a context, uh, and, and which makes that an impossible interpretation. Uh, so, continuing on, uh, Paul does say, rather... Uh, she, that is, woman, is to remain quiet, and then he roots that in creation. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing. Again, I don't have time to get into the full argument here, but this is not saying you get into heaven by having children. Uh, this is probably related to Jesus in particular uh, and imagery around uh, the Virgin Mary, uh, although related to uh, roles. But again, we're, saved, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace through faith. So again, unless we're to take this by itself without the rest of the context of the Bible is to completely have a different theology than what we believe. Uh, in fact, I always think it's kind of funny when people want to take the first part of this and apply it super literalistically, but then uh, literalistically. So there's literally and then there's literalistically. Literally is a word that colloquially we use to mean actually, uh, but the proper use of the word literally means within the context of the literature. Uh, a lot of people misuse the word literally. Literalistically means basically taking the words at face value alone interpreted entirely outside of context. Uh, so if I say, uh, you know, uh, they got away with it, uh, that becomes a problem if we're not talking about stealing something. Uh, because to say they got away is to imply that they physically moved on. But sometimes we're talking about, well, they managed to uh, get by with something. Right, so basically every turn of phrase, uh, uh, I've got egg on my face. That means I'm embarrassed. But if you take it literalistically, someone has to go grab some eggs out of the fridge and throw them at me. Right, so we, we want to be careful that we don't apply things literalistically if it's not appropriate to the context. Uh, so... Uh, it. It's always funny to me when people want to apply one phrase literalistically, but then in the next sentence they don't, uh, because their theology teaches them better. So anyway, uh, the woman will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. Again, those last, that entire phrase after childbearing is equally applicable to men. Right? There's no difference between men and women 
there. So uh, essentially, without getting into way more of this, uh, when we begin to read around the teachings, so we read 1 Timothy 3, which I read some to you last week, when we see what women uh, were, did in the Old Testament, when we see what women did in Acts, and we see them being affirmed in those roles, uh, and then we look at 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, and we see being women commanded to do, to do all sorts of things, in particular in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, it is said that all people, men and women, ought to pray in church uh, and that they can even have a word of wisdom that adds a bunch of shading. That means that whatever Paul means by the woman is to learn quietly with all submissiveness, it cannot mean she never teaches in front of men at all ever, uh, and it can't mean literalistically that sh you're not supposed to open your mouth. Obviously, your, your women are meant to join in prayer, in singing, uh, and in certain limited roles at, within the church body in teaching. What seems to be the case here, particularly because the next place Paul goes is to uh, elders, where he does specifically use the word for men, uh, this seems to be talking about the office itself. So it's talking about women being limited from the office. Uh, and that is rooted in creation, which is further rooted, if we go to Ephesians 5, in the church as family. Uh, where men, as we said, uh, there is a, we just have to be honest, there is a mild patriarchal aspect to the Bible. But again, outside of uh, modern Western culture, that is not necessarily a thing that's looked down on. Uh, generally, the only folks that really get their panties in a twist over uh, patriarchal stuff are uh, highly educated Western peop uh, people. Uh, in general, as particularly as the Bible, the Old Testament, presents patriarchy, it was actually meant as a protection when it was not abused. Uh, and again, you can go back and listen to my lecture where I address that at length and tried to defend that. I, I've also, I'm very careful to say it's a mild patriarchy, not a strict like Middle Eastern patriarchy, right? Um, the, women don't need to cover their whole faces and they're allowed to have educations and be presidents and be business leaders and all sorts of things, right? Uh, the only places where there's really limitation uh, is in the rare, rare case where the man actually has to assert uh, their headship, which, by the way, men, if you've ever had to assert headship more than once in your marriage, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah, I'll stand by that. Men, if you've ever had to assert headship more than once in your marriage, you're probably doing it wrong. Uh, because in general, that should not be a trigger that needs to be pulled outside of some extreme situations. Um, uh, getting back on track here. Uh, so, uh, women are able to do anything an unordained man can do. Someone will then throw at me, well, what about uh, unordained men who get to preach on occasion? Those men are testing their gifts in order to enter the ministry, so they I mean, I think anyone who's thinking clearly would say that is an obvious exception to the rule, not an exception that, you know, violates the rule. Uh, if anything, it's the exception that proves the rule. Uh, so yes, in general, I would say women are able to do anything an unordained man can do. The Bible itself roots it in creation, and I don't fully understand why God did it that way. But... God loves us enough to enter into this world. God loves us enough to experience suffering, to experience oppression, to the point of dying unjustly on a cross. And God is powerful enough to return to life on the third day. And if God loves us that much, and if God is that powerful, then when he tells us something, even if we don't understand it, we ought to believe it. So I do not fully understand why women may not hold office. But God has clearly said it. And because I trust him 
And I realize this is easy for me to say, I'm not only a man, I'm an ordained man. I get it. I, I mean, I can't change what is. Um, if God is true and good enough to tell us what right and wrong are, then on occasion, when he tells us something that doesn't make sense to us, we can and should obey it, not because we like it, but because we trust him. So I don't understand, but the Bible clearly teaches it. I don't teach that women can't be pastors because I like it or understand it. I teach it because it's what the Bible says, and I believe the Bible is true, even the parts I'm not comfortable with. That is faith. Um, Randy, you were going to say something. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was our sister Rebecca who taught us last week. You did, and appropriately so, that uh, by reminding us of Ephesians five, that uh, which you just also just quoted, but earlier it says that. The man is to love his wife as his own body, as Christ loved the church. Right? And, and the whole point of that is that she made is if man is doing it right, it's not a burden for the woman. Uh, so, and so, yeah, I think everything you said is correct. I would just add that qualifier on the front of it. Um, so, uh, again, I... Actually, this, so here's the actual takeaway that I want from this. And it's probably not what you think. Um, don't decide if Christianity is true based on what it says about women being pastors. Don't decide if Christianity is true based on what the Bible says about women being pastors determine whether or not Christianity is true at all. Did Jesus rise from the dead? Was he the son of God? Because if not, then none of this matters, and you're wasting your time here. And by the way, that's a biblical thing to say. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 says, if none of these things are true, we are of all people most to be pitied. But if Jesus rose from the dead, if he is God become a man, then whether or not we like what he says should not change whether or not we believe what he says. We believe lots of things we don't like if they're true. I don't like that there is currently war between Israel and Hamas, but I believe there is because I've seen a whole bunch of videos that I have good reason to believe are actually displaying truth to me. Now, there are possibilities that it's all doctored and none of that exists, but, but I don't think that's likely for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, we do not accept Christianity. Please don't. Don't accept Christianity based on whether or not you like a particular idiosyncratic, that means an odd, uh, don't accept Christianity based on whether or not you like a particular teaching of Christianity. Believe Christianity based on whether or not it is true. And then let the cards fall where they will. That's actually logical thinking. You don't believe things based on whether or not you like them. You believe them based on whether or not they are true. To say you will not believe something because you don't like it is to get things the wrong way around.
All right. That is uh, a quick, lousy defense of our uh, position that women can't be pastors, and my plea to you that just because Christianity teaches something you don't like is not a reason to disbelieve Christianity. Any questions or thoughts about that before we change chapters? I feel very uncomfortable teaching about it. Um, if, if, if any ladies want to stand up and back me up, I'd really take it right now. <laughs> it's really interesting to me because um, I think that the, the sensitivity to that is um, a lot of it is culturally um, embedded. Yeah. Right. Right. Sure. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it's very, you're correct. It's very cultural. It's also very generational. Uh, I mean, I'm probably more sensitive to it than you for a, a not big, just because I'm 20 years younger than you, um, or more, 30 <laughs> years younger than you. Uh, but, but right, I, I came out of a truly egalitarian uh, background uh, that would have utterly condemned this, a and uh, on top of that, I have had odd experiences where I actually did work under, I worked under women clergy. Um, now, I, I, not because I had changed my view, it was just how the Lord works circumstances, but those women were godly women who loved Jesus and were doing good ministry. And when my experience starts to rub up against what the Bible says, I mean, not to, it takes a lot of faith to keep going, no, I, the Bible matters, not my experience. Right? The Bible corrects my experience, not the other way around. Um, sorry, John Wesley. <laughs> uh, if you know, John Wesley had the quadrivium and experience was sort of on, almost on, this is unfair, this is a caricature, but... Sometimes it felt as though experience was on par with Scripture, and that's just not true. The Bible always corrects our experience, not the other way around. Uh, Marvin. Yeah, I, I think that's an appropriate. Uh, I think that's an appropriate comparison. So thank you for that. Yeah. Oh. You know, like big structure or being taught to believe different things. Right. And I think, like, I've even been at um, general assembly, and a woman who's been raised Catholic, but she's never been to church, and she's been raised in a Catholic church, and she's never been to 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 church, and she's never been Yeah. I protest 
Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Amen. And we should be praying for him and his salvation. Yeah, and I mean, I don't even know that goes so far as to say that he's not saved, but he certainly misunderstands the Bible. Yeah. Yeah, so... so Yeah, no, I think it's really helpful. Thank you, Bethany. Um, yeah. Actually, I would say, Greta, I really appreciated the point where the where the serpent sort of whispered in Eve's ear, but just like Adam stood silent, yeah. if we're going to be a church that upholds that men are going to be elders and they're going to be pastors over women, then you have to know the women in the church. Eve's, know the women, advocate for them, pray for them. So I'm going to sort of wrap this up with two things. One is logical and one is laying my cards on the table, which is not always the wisest thing to do, but I want you guys to know who you hired so you can decide if you want me to be your pastor. Um, <laughs> so the, first, the logical one. Um, slippery slope logic. Uh, it's often called the slippery slope fallacy. But if you ever take a logic class... By the way, I'm taking a doctoral level logic class. Um, so I've thought about this. By the way, uh, the slippery slope is always a fallacy. Slippery slope is not logic. Uh, in fact, I would go so far to say that anyone who uses the slippery slope at that moment is making the mistake of the Pharisees. Notice I very carefully crafted that. I didn't say they are Pharisees. Because I can think of one man whom I love who is not pharisaical but will occasionally use the slippery slope argument and I have to go stop acting like a Pharisee. That's not okay. <laughs> um, um, but slippery slope logic is not logic. Uh, that, that is the fallacy that the Pharisees used to create their 619 laws that were a burden to the people. Please... Don't ever say the word slippery slope to me except to condemn it because I promise you that just will not go well with me. Uh, that is not logical. Slippery slopes are not logical. Um, th there, are, there are other forms of logic that can be suggestive, uh, uh, but um, slippery slope is always a fallacy. Okay, said that three, at least three times. You probably got that. Uh, second, so um, I... For those of you who don't care about denominational politics, just turn me off for a second. But for those of you who do, I definitely come down on a side in a disagreement inside of our denomination. Uh, and I come down on the side that, I've already said it, and 
a woman can do anything an unordained man can do. Uh, and that is not agreed upon necessarily in our entire denomination, but I'm not defending their position. I'm defending my position. Uh, but uh, I was similarly appalled when that happened. And it, I was there, and it has happened at least one time I'm aware of since the incident you're talking about. And I did protest that person who, I protested the person who protested. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, now, some people may disagree. I mean, uh, some people in this denomination do disagree with me, and some of you guys may be those people, and I'm happy to talk about that. But um, I, um, I disagree with the quote-unquote Billy Graham rule, may he rest in peace and rise in glory. I, there's a reason I have told you, and I've had lunch with some of you women, single women, married women, I am not afraid to spend one-on-one -on -one time with a woman, uh, and I'm not afraid for Caitlin to go spend one-on-one -on -one time with a man. I just, I, I think that is not healthy if we are living in a culture that is that afraid, because that's slippery slope logic. Now, listen, I've dealt with a lot. I, I've passed through people through a lot of divorces, and I've seen adultery more than once. It's not like I, and I've seen pastors commit adultery and discipline them more than once. I am not unaware that that is a thing that can happen. But we cannot allow bad actors to cause us to make bad rules. Yeah. My question is why didn't the mass of men at that assembly stand up and protest? Many of us did. Uh, 500 of us, there's a list. Uh, the other, there was probably about 500 that were on their side, and there were probably about 1,000 that just, for whatever reason, decided they didn't want to get in the middle of that fight that probably came down on different sides of the issue. I mean, that's, that's speculation. Uh, I only know the list of 500 of us who spoke about it. Thank you. Um, okay. Woo. Um, so I have ten minutes left, and I still don't have my slides. I'm Carl. Would you start us off by talking about slavery? Uh, let me make three minutes worth of comments, and I'm basically going to give. Wait, we're done at ten fifteen. Crud. Uh, okay. You get to start the next class. You get a full 10 minutes to start the next class, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but that means you have to be here next Sunday. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So I'm just going to start this and leave off in the middle of it. Uh, so uh, some people's objection will be that Christianity and the Bible has been used to oppress people and condone slavery. And much like the, the issue of women being oppressed, I have to say, yes, it has been misused that way, but no, the Bible does not teach that. Full stop. No qualification. Now, let me qualify that. <laughs> uh, so, you guys cannot see my slides. I need to quit acting like you can. Um, slavery, well, I, I'm going to deal with this with the Old Testament first. And obviously, I'm going to run out of time while dealing with the Old Testament. So after Carl speaks next week, I will then skip to the New Testament. So I'm, a, I'm going to deal with slavery in the Old Testament in six and a half minutes. Buckle up. <laughs> uh, ooh, I, 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 that's actually a great passage to go to, although I'm going to make my argument sort of the other way around. Um, Numbers 21 is what he said, by the way, which is a very appropriate passage. Um, but uh, slavery in Israel uh, was in many ways what we call employment today. Now I'm talking about specifically in the Old Testament. The New Testament actually provides a bunch of other factors that are far more complicated. So just remember, 
Everything I'm talking about right now is Old Testament, Old Testament law in particular. I'm looking basically at Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So, uh, there is a word that can be translated, it is sometimes and has in certain historic translations been translated as slave, but I think that's a misnomer. Uh, It's far better translated as something like servant or even bond servant. But essentially, uh, it means something relatively similar to what we mean by employment today. Because this servanthood was not imposed by an outsider, such as it was by slave traders and plantation owners in the antebellum south. It was also notably not race-based chattel slavery. Full stop. Um, What uh, this word translated slave, or maybe better as servant, in the Old Testament was a Hebrew word that could even refer to a debt servanthood, but that still couldn't be compared to conditions uh, in colonial America. If you don't know this, uh, I'm actually getting even before race-based chattel slavery, uh, there were many who needed to pay for fare to America, and it was too costly for them to afford, so they would contract themselves out working in households, often in apprentice-like positions, until they paid back their debts. And so one half to two thirds uh, of white immigrants uh, to Britain's colonies were indentured servants in this way, right? So this was voluntary. That that is really more reflective uh, of Old Testament slavery. It was a voluntary, non-race-based indentured servanthood that you could actually pay off the debt for. In fact, if you didn't work enough to pay off the debt, the Old Testament had fun laws about how all debts were to be forgiven every seven years. Man, my debts would have been forgiven at least twice over since I took them on. Um, But uh, actually, today's American society has a different system. I am not, I'm actually basically allowed to live freely. Move on, okay. That's another, that's, a, that's an over coffee conversation. Uh, anyway, uh, likewise, an Israelite strapped for shekels might become an indentured servant to pay off his debt to what we might call a boss or employer today. Uh, and so uh, calling them master is probably far too strong of a term. Uh, we also forget that the word mister comes from the word master. We were just trying to soften it. Uh, but And actually, it was often associated with your degree. Uh, so I would be the Reverend Master Martin uh, by virtue of my degrees. Uh, but we don't use it that way anymore. Uh, so fun things about linguistics. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, calling him a master is a too strong, uh, uh, just as the term ebed, that's the word for servant, or, or even uh, could translate as employee, Uh, shouldn't really be translated as slave. Uh, John Golding Jay, uh, who's an Old Testament uh, scholar who I don't always agree with, but I do here, (laughs) uh, comments that there is nothing inherently lowly or undignified about being an ebed. Uh, Indeed, it is an honorable and dignified term because it's for someone who's working for a living. Um, So even when the terms... So... There are, we'll see the word buy or sell or acquire used of people, uh, but, and we mistakenly read that because we're removed from the cultural context as reading it about treating people as property. But think of it more like sports players today, right? They get traded to another team. Uh, they get uh, re- bought for the team. Uh, they, they get taken so that they now belong to a team. And teams do have owners, but we're not talking about slavery when we talk about that. Right, so when you read buy, sell, acquire, you need to read it more in that, uh, in that, voluntary, that voluntarily entered profitable sense. Uh, you gotta remember, these people were paid. Right, they weren't unpaid slaves. They were actually both working off their debts and receiving a living wage while doing so. Right? That, that, is, they, they, that is a very different set of things. They were professional. 
right? And so, uh, the, and these were formal contractual, agree co contractual agreements that had definite end dates. And so contrary to many critics, uh, this servanthood wasn't much different experientially from paid employment in a cash economy like ours. Remember, theirs was a little bit different. It was an agrarian economy. They did, sh the concept of shekels didn't come around for a hot minute. Uh, and even when it talks about shekels in the Old Testament, it's really talking about uh, weights, not uh, coin currency as we know it. So if anything, when we read the Old Testament, we have in the Bible the first appeals in world literature to treat people like this as human beings for their own sake and not just the interest of their masters. Right. So if, if anything, we actually see these slaves that weren't slaves as in the way that we often think of it at all, uh, lifted up and protected. By comparison, the idea of a slave as exclusively the object of rights and as a person outside regular society was alien to the laws of the rest of the ancient Near East, uh, who were often slaves forcibly branded uh, with tattoos. Uh, this actually may be behind the, uh, the Levitical law of Leviticus 19 not to get tattoos, which, um, by the way, total freebie, I think it's fine to get tattoos now because we no longer live under that. That was a ceremonial law. And with that fun, trivial fact, we need to pray and go. And we will pick up right there, right after Carl talks next week. Yeah? You look like you are fixing to say something. Yes. That's New Testament. Oh. We're dealing with the Old Testament right now. Okay. And we've got to be done. Uh, let, let, let me pray for us. Uh, Father, um, first of all, please heal our technology so I have slides next week. <laughs> um, but also, Lord, uh, send your spirit to um, protect my words that I would only say truth. And please forgive me any, and correct me anywhere I have erred. Uh, please, spirit, be pleased to use these people whom I have taught today to correct me anywhere I've been in error. Um, but, uh, Lord, may you use my words, may you use this time uh, to truly uh, comfort our hearts where historical abuses may have given us doubts about your love and about your existence. Uh, strengthen our faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.